Good morning. morning. Y'all are quiet. It was kind of weird walking in here. I think you just watched the video and everybody was like hushed. Do y'all like our acolyte this morning? Let's let's give it up for our acolyte this morning. <laughs> Good. You're on time, Deb. All right. Good morning. I'm Jason, one of the pastors here. It's good to see all of you. It really is. What a good crowd. Um, We're excited you're here. We welcome all guests and visitors also. So as we're continuing in worship, I just want to mention a few things in the bulletin as we get started. If you'll turn to the back of the bulletin there, you'll see youth and uh, all the Ignite and and, uh, MYF um, festivities and activities going on tonight. You'll see the church office is closed tomorrow because of President's Day. Uh, Our last Wednesday night session of Irresistible Faith uh, by author Scott Sauls being led by Ken Allen uh, will be this Wednesday at 6. That uh, wonderful uh, um, opportunity to come and finish that up if you haven't heard it. I hope if you haven't been able to come, you've been checking it out on Facebook. Um, Ken's been doing a good job with that. So you'll see uh, an opportunity as the attendance pads come around to, to write down if you'd like to join us for the meal Um, And then looking ahead, on March the 4th, the Wednesday night meal and program will be held in the Fellowship Hall. That's about midway through the back of the bulletin. That's because we're getting ready for the consignment sale. And really, that's the big announcement in the back here is Thursday, March 5th through Saturday, March the 7th. Save the date, the the Sacred Sparks Children consignment sale. You heard a little bit about that last week, too. If you'll turn to the inside of the bulletin... You'll see that uh, the chancel flowers are given in loving memory of Bob Moore by the family. And also there's a rose on the altar in celebration of the birth of Emma Kate Garner, born February the 4th. Proud parents are Chase Garner and Katie Smith and grandparents Bob and Lori Smith and Aunt Hannah Smith. We're excited about this birth. Yeah, let's give God some glory for that. And they're here today. You can love on them a little bit. Um... And also do want to mention a couple of other, we see folks listed in, in prayer that we need to remember. Let's never forget to do that. We are a praying church. Do want to add an update. Uh, Bill and Sharon Hargraves are on their second leg of their journey back. Uh, they're flying from London to Chicago. So just be in prayer for safe travels. And hopefully they'll be home later today or tomorrow. I'm not sure. Um, and then also we want to mention Catherine Reeder. Catherine's been having some, some issues, some heart issues, and she's been in the hospital, and we want to continue to pray for Catherine and Wayne. They're a couple of uh, dear souls that are, are shut-ins, and we just want to pray for them. And also, Martha Farmer's having a minor procedure tomorrow, and we, she would just ask for, for prayers as well. She'll be home the next day. So lots of things to pray for, lots of things to give thanks to God for. I'm just excited to be here with you all today. Are you all ready to worship? Amen. Well, with that said, let's do it. Thank you, Jason. We are glad you're here. We hope you're ready to worship with us this morning. Let's stand together, raise our voices to the roof in praise of our God today.
Amen. Um, I left the tears on my cheek on purpose, folks. God ever get a hold of you in service? I, I mean, you know, everybody has a different way of responding to the Holy Spirit, but my eyes like to leak sometimes. So I would like to just say thank you, praise team. Thank you for the servants of this church that allow God's Spirit to work and move, that facilitate it, that put us at the throne. I'm at the throne, people. Y'all want to join me? Let's do it. Gracious and loving Lord, oh, how great you are, how marvelous you are, how wonderful you are. I look at this, this rose on the altar, and I think about new birth, and I think about how you've blessed a family, and I think about what you're going to do in the life of that little baby. And Lord, I think about Sharon and Bill striving to come home to their church family. And we've been praying them up. And you've got them. And you're going to get them home. And they're going to be okay. Lord, that's two examples of ways that you've moved in the life of this church this week. Daily. Daily you forgive us. Daily you nourish us with your word and spirit. Lord, we come to you to worship you because you are you. And you are worthy. And you are God. And you are amazing. And Father, there's times where we take that for granted. So, Lord, in all things, you are good. And when things aren't good in this world, you make them good. You work out a way. So, Lord, we come to you today. We should come to you every day, humble, grateful, in love with you. We want to continue to worship you. Lord, may we pray to you unceasingly daily. May our thoughts always be on you. They are so high, those thoughts. Lord God, we come to you in amazement. We're here to worship. Lord, help us today. Work in us. Allow your Holy Spirit to move in us. Lord, let us take this amazing thing that you've done in our lives and show others. Lord, they all need to know it. We pray this prayer of thanks and blessing and gratitude today. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statuses and seek him with their all of their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees, that I would not be put to shame when I considered all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me.
Amen. My goodness. The Lord God Almighty is so good, isn't he? Two of you. The Lord God Almighty is good. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What's the old saying, Jason, if you if that didn't light your fire, your wood's wet? Amen. Well, last week we talked about the fear of the Lord. We talked about how there's two kinds of fear in the Scripture, how there's, how there's the fear of the Lord having that great respect and reverence for God. I about fell off the stage. That great reverence and respect for God and then having that fear of everything else. All right? And we talked about how that fear of everything else gets in the way of our relationship with God and all the Scriptures say you need to abandon it. Just get rid of it out of your life. And so we focused on that <clears throat> last week. Did you notice that the, uh, the scripture was read during the special music? Did you catch that? Anybody catch that? That it was beautifully read through that, and I appreciate that today. And I and, uh, wanted to let you know that Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses, okay? The psalmist had a lot to say that day, I guess. Now, I want to let you know that uh, the, uh, the young people read the first eight verses, and I want you to com get comfortable because I'm going to read the other 168, okay? <laughs> Y'all just get comfortable, okay? We should be out of here in time for you to go to lunch. <laughs> what a beautiful and wonderful psalm it is. And what I want us to do today is I will be referring to some of the other, not all 168, but I will be making reference to it. But I want us to think about this psalm, and I want us to think about what it's trying to tell us. God speaks through the psalm today to remind us <clears throat> Blessed are those whose ways are blameless. <clears throat> Blessed are those whose ways are blameless. As we look at the scripture today, we are reminded that uh, the psalmist was giving great devotion to the word of God. And the writer is described as someone who's devoted to God's Word in that way of life, wanting to focus completely on what God is doing and what God has to say. So we find in that scripture that, that God is directing this individual to live his life a certain way. So the writer speaks of his own mistakes and heart and life, but he talks about how he strives to live a holy life we need to make sure as we think about our lives as God's people that God is holy and we have the opportunity to live a holy life we have the opportunity to strive to live a holy life amen or to seek God's wisdom and God's love you know we're not perfect but God gives us the opportunity to strive to live a holy life so today as we look at this, we, we find that the writer's talking about how God has helped him to live a righteous life. As we begin our first eight verses, the writer says, people are blessed who live a blameless life. People who walk with the Lord, people who strive to live in the Lord's ways. The writer says that keeping God's statutes and seeking God must be done with all of our heart. Not just part of our heart, but all of our heart. We learn that when we strive to do nothing wrong, 
when we seek to live God's ways, we can live that holy life. In verses 4 through 8, he talks about how obeying God is something that we must do in all of our ways. Because in doing so, we have the opportunity to have the help of God in our lives. So you see, as we go back through it again, look at that. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of God. Blameless living happens because we walk according to what God wants us to do. Blessed are those who keep his statutes if they seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong but follow his ways. God, you lay down your precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Not partially obeyed, but fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. I believe what he's saying there is, if I could just do it, God. Oh, if my ways, oh, if I could just overcome my wrongdoing and my mistakes, I will be able to obey you. then I could not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. I believe the writer is saying, God, I'm trying real hard. I'm trying to live the life you want me to live. Help me. And I'll do the best I can. I'll stay close to you. I'll follow your ways. I will strive to be the holy individual you want me to, to be and to live. You see, we discover that the writer is saying that God's word is all that we need. God's word is what gives us hope. God's word is the standard of truth and value for our behavior. It's all we need for godly living. Now there's some terms in here we need to define. Law, testimony, precepts, statutes, commands, judgments, and word. You see the writer throws all those words on you. are going, oh my goodness, I thought I was doing good just to keep the commandments. But I got to do statutes and precepts and all this other stuff too? What in the world are those things? So let me just give you a little definition of some of those things. The law, of course, when he speaks of the law, is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. It's the scriptures that focus on what the Lord requires of us. When the word testimony is used, it's talking about the content of God's word about what God says about himself and about his will, about God's will for our lives. Testimony. When you see the word precept used, it means the instruction or the teaching of God. When you see the word statute used, it means those words that are engraved on our hearts by God. Those words that are permanent and unchangeable about God's word in our lives. When you see the word command, it means those words to obey that God has given you. Do these specific things. When you see the word judgment, it's God's decision for humanity. And when you just see the word word, it's God's revealing power to us. So when you're at Walmart tomorrow and you're standing in this long line, you can turn and introduce yourself to the lady or the man next to you and say, did you know what a precept is? (laughs) And say, I think I've got time to explain that to you because we're in line. Do you know what a statute is? So a little education for you because sometimes we read God's word and it throws out all these words. And it's not easy to understand, but it's a reminder basically of this psalm that the writer is saying, God, your word is wonderful, and I want to live by it. I want to be a part of what you're doing. 
Now, beyond Psalm 119, you're going to discover that all through the Scriptures, the Old Testament, New Testament, the New Testament writings, Gospels, that there are various examples of how to live a blameless life. And I want you to hear a few of those. Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus is talking to the rich young ruler and he says, If you want to be perfect, go sell everything. Give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Part of living a blameless life, I believe, is that we realize that there's absolutely nothing else or anyone else that needs to take first place in front of God. Amen? That God must be first. Making our relationship with God is the priority of our lives. Not having anything in our lives that takes the place of dominance over God is the way I believe God wants us to live. Allowing God to always be our first love and not lose that place. So Jesus speaks of that in Matthew. Get rid of everything else. If my relationship with you, if, if God's presence in your life is important to you, get rid of everything else and put me in the place where other things were at one time. And then we find in Romans 12 that the writer of Romans says, Don't conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't focus on the standards of the world to live a blameless life. You must let go of those standards of the world. The scripture reminds us that we are to focus solely on what God wants from us and allow God to transform our lives. Philippians chapter 2 reminds us to live a blameless life by saying, do everything without grumbling and arguing. A lot of you chuckled. So that you may become blameless... And pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. I like that, warped and crooked generation. Some folks are warped and crooked, not y'all, but everybody else, right? <laughs> then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then you'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. To live a blameless life, Philippians 2 says, don't complain. Seek to live a holy life. Heard a preacher years ago that he said that there need to be another commandment, thou shalt not bellyache. That's pretty good. We shouldn't complain, we should be thankful for God's place in our lives. <coughs> And then Colossians 3 says, and all over, and all, excuse me, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love should be always our focus. Love should bring unity. Love is the standard. If we want to live a blameless life, if we want to seek what God has for us, we've got to love. And that's just some other scriptures that relate to this topic. I think it is important as we seek to live a blameless life that we realize that we live in a world of blame. Amen. We live in a world of blame. There are individuals in the world that are making constant accusations, maybe about you, maybe about someone you love. Maybe a friend or a co-worker. Someone is making a constant accusation out there. Constant finger pointing is going on in our world. Have you noticed that? We live in a world of blame. 
We live in a world of the constant he said, she said. We live in a world that has constant persecution. And you know, the evil one is the author of confusion and lies and tries to get us to blame everyone and everything. Instead of taking responsibility like the writer of Psalm 119 says, God, I've messed up. I want to live your ways. Help me. We live in a world of blame. I can remember growing up and my, my brother Jeff, who was four years older than me, he, he went on to glory about almost three years ago. He had uh, had a lot of health issues and 54 years old. And I miss him, but I remember growing up with him, and he blamed me for everything, <laughs> no matter what. He could get caught red-handed, and he would say, I did it. Blame me for everything. I remember one thing that still chafes me a little bit to this day. We used to get an allowance. Now, it wasn't a lot of money, but we used to get an allowance from Dad would give us a little money. And my brother Jeff concocted this scheme that we needed a catcher's outfit. I mean, the whole thing, pads, pad, you know, the whole mitt, catcher's outfit. I didn't care a thing about baseball, but he thought we needed a catcher's outfit. So he convinced my dad that we would forfeit our allowance. We. And so dad went for it. And then my brother refused to let me use the catcher's outfit. He and his buddies had a lot of fun. He blamed me for everything. But you know, he grew up and... We remained close, and he became a wonderful and powerful man of God. And he was a vessel that touched many lives. You see, we live in a world of blame. But it doesn't mean that we have to be a part of it. Amen? We can choose to seek to live a blameless life. We're not perfect people, but we can seek God at all times. We can seek to be people of integrity. We can make that decision right now every time we make a move. We can choose to be people of integrity. We can seek to be people who apply God's word in our lives and in our situations. We can seek to be people who desire nothing but to honor God in every aspect of our lives. We can strive to be blameless people by choosing to live this way. You see, the writer says in verse 10, God, I want to seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Keep me there, God. Keep me close to you. I want to seek you with my heart. In verse 18, he says, Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things in your law. Help me to see what's important in your law. <clears throat> in verse 30 and 31, he says, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I've deliberately chosen to live this way. I have set my heart on your laws. I will hold fast to your statutes, Lord, and do not let me be put to shame. In verse 41, he says, May your unfailing love come to me, Lord, your salvation according to your promise. In verse 103 and through 105, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You've heard that one before, haven't you? It's in Psalm 119. 
And then he says in verse 160, All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. The writer's saying, I want to live this way with every power within my being. I want to strive to live a blameless life. Then why can't we do that? Why don't we strive to do the same thing? Well, folks, it requires an unwavering trust. It requires us believing that the one who began a good work in us will make sure to complete it. It's trusting in what God has for us. Dara McLean, a Christian singer, wrote a song called Blameless. Let me share a couple words with you. Now alive and the power in me is you. Now blameless. You call me holy. I've been forgiven. You call me righteous. I'm free. Now spotless, you call me worthy. I am your child. You call me chosen. I'm yours. I will boldly come running straight to the one singing over me. No one can take this from me. Let me repeat that. No one can take this from me. I'm a child that you name free. Nothing will separate us. I'm held by you, and I know, yes, I know I am blameless. God calls us to live blameless lives. Embracing the idea that we are God's children. Embracing the idea that blameless means that we're not guilty because of what Jesus Christ has done by dying on the cross and rising from the dead, we are pronounced pardoned and forgiven. Embracing that gift of forgiveness is a powerful and wonderful thing. God calls us to a blameless life where we seek to have significance and purpose with everyone that we encounter. As we seek to live well, to laugh often, and to love extravagantly, we have the opportunity to be blameless. May we be like the psalmist and surrender our lives to God's care and God's love. The writer says, I can't do it without you, God. But with you, applying your word in my life, I can be blameless. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I say these things in the name of the Christ. Amen. The altar rail is open for anyone that would like to come and pray for any reason whatsoever. If you have a desire to say yes to Christ, would you come? If you have a desire to want to unite with this congregation, would you come? If you just have a prayer need, Jason and I are available to pray with you. Let's mind the Spirit as we stand and sing, show me your ways.
want to ask you a question as we leave. Are you trying? Are you trying to live for him? Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, seeking to live well, to laugh often, and to love extravagantly, doing it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.